Hello, and welcome to Chapter 17, Cardiovascular Emergencies. This is a long chapter, and so we have decided to split it up into three parts. The first part is the anatomy and physiology review. Part two is going to be electrophysiology. And part three is pathophysiology assessment and management of specific cardiovascular problems. And so we're going to start off with the anatomy and physiology, and let's get started. Upon completion of this chapter and the related coursework, you will be able to describe the anatomy and physiology of the cardiovascular system. You will be able to apply various patient presentations, integrate assessment findings, formulate a field impression, and implement a comprehensive treatment plan for the management of those conditions involving the cardiovascular system. You will be able to recognize signs and symptoms of common cardiovascular conditions and disorders, demonstrate relevant assessment techniques for cardiac function, perform diagnostic testing of cardiac status, and manage patients using techniques and skills for cardiovascular emergencies. You will be able to discuss pathophysiology, risk factors, and common medications that may be seen in the cardiovascular emergency patient. You will also be able to safely perform interventions and treatments for patients having a cardiovascular emergency. So let's get started. The role of a paramedic was created more than 40 years ago to provide early treatment for patients with acute myocardial infarct, or AMI. AMI occurs when sudden narrowing or complete occlusion of a coronary artery causes a myocardial tissue necrosis. The American Heart Association estimates that one person has an AMI in the United States about every 40 seconds. Cardiac arrest is the sensation of cardiac mechanical activity, as confirmed by the absence of signs of circulation. In the United States, emergency medical services, or EMS, personnel treat about 60% of out-of-hospital cardiac arrest each year. A paramedic must be able to integrate pathophysiology, principles, and assessment findings to formulate a field impression and implement a treatment plan for patients with cardiovascular disease, and that's also known as CVD, cardiovascular disease. So let's do a little bit of a review of the anatomy and physiology of the cardiovascular system. We'll start with the structure and function. So the cardiovascular system is composed of the heart and blood vessels, its primary function is to deliver oxygenated blood and nutrients to cells in the body. It's responsible for delivering chemical messengers known as hormones and transports metabolic waste products from cells or to recycling or waste disposal sites. The heart has four chambers, the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, and left ventricle. The right atrium is an upper chamber. It receives blood low in oxygen from the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and the coronary sinus. The left atrium is an upper chamber as well. It receives fresh oxygenated blood from the lungs by the way of the right and left pulmonary veins. The aorta then contracts pumping blood through the atrial ventricular valve into the ventricles. The right ventricle is a lower chamber. It pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs. And the left ventricle is a low chamber as well. It pumps oxygenated blood throughout the body. When the left ventricle contracts, it produces an impulse palpable at the apex of the heart. It's also called the point of maximal impulse, or PMI. Septum, it's an internal wall of connective tissue separates the right and left sides of the heart. The intraatrial septum, it separates the right and left atria. And the intraventricular septum separates the right and left ventricles. The septa separate the heart into two functional pumps. The right atrium and right ventricle compose one pump. 
sometimes called the right heart. It's a low pressure system of pulmonary circulation. Left atrium and the left ventricle compose the other. And this is sometimes called the left heart. This is a high pressure pump. This is systemic circulation. The myocardium is the middle layer of the heart wall. It comprises mostly thick cardiac muscle tissue. It's responsible for cardiac contraction and efficient ejection of blood from the heart. There are two main coronary arteries that supply blood to the tissues of the heart. The left main coronary artery, or LMCA, the left main coronary artery is the largest in diameter and shortest of myocardial blood vessels. It rapidly divides into the left anterior descending artery, or the LAD, and the circumflex artery. The areas supplied by the coronary arteries differ among patients. The LAD supplies blood from the anterior surface of the left ventricle, part of the lateral surface of the left ventricle, and a portion of the intraventricular septum in most patients. The circumflex artery supplies the left atrium, part of the left lateral surface of the left ventricle, and the inferior surface of the left ventricle in about 15% of people, the posterior surface of the left ventricle in about 15% of people, and the sinoatrial or SA node in about 40% of the people, and the atrioventricular bundle in 10 to 15% of the people. The right coronary artery or RAC branches off the right coronary artery supply blood to the walls of the right atrium and ventricle. A portion of the inferior part of the left ventricle and portions of the conduction system or the SA node in about 60% of the people and the atrioventricular bundle in about 85 to 90% of the people. The figure on this slide shows the coronary arteries, the anterior and the posterior view. Cardiac cells have four important properties that help the heart function effectively and efficiently. They have automaticity, excitability, conductivity, and contractility. The cardiac conduction system comprises of six parts. That's the SA node, the atrioventricular node, the bundle of His, the right bundle branches, left bundle branches, and the Purkinje fibers. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about nerve stimulation. And their stimulation by the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nerves are stimulated. So stimulation of the sympathetic nerves strengthens, strengthens the force of the contraction and increases the heart rate. And stimulation of the parasympathetic nerves slows the rate of discharge of the SA node, slows conduction through the atrial ventricular node, weakens the strength of atrial contraction, and can cause a small reduction in the force of the ventricular contraction. Okay, so now we're going to get into the assessment. That was um, the review of pathophysiology and anatomy. So a patient with cardiovascular-related symptoms may be young, middle-aged, or older adult. A systematic approach to patient assessment is important. It helps to ensure you do not overlook physical findings and important questions pertinent to the treatment plan for your patient. Okay, so let's start with the primary survey. The order of the steps for performing a primary survey differs depending on the type of cardiac patient. The order of steps in the primary survey is normally A, B, C, D, E, and that's at, um, assess airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. If the patient is found unresponsive and is suspected of being in cardiac arrest, of course, the order changes to C, A, B, D, E because we're doing the circulation first, starting chest compressions, then airway breathing. So next is the history taking, and that's the AMPL and OPQRST. And the acute coronary syndromes, or ACS, are a series of cardiac conditions that are caused by an abrupt reduction of blood flow through a coronary artery. There are three major ACS. There's unstable angina, non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarct, or N-STEMI, and ST elevation 
myocardial infarct, and that's STEMI. Common chief complaints in a patient experiencing an ACS include chest discomfort, dyspnea, fainting, palpations, and fatigue. Chest pain or discomfort is often the presenting symptom in a patient with ACS. The description of discomfort is for assessing its significance. The OPQRST mnemonic is what we use, and uh, if you've forgotten what that stands for, it's onset, provocation, palpation, quality, region of radiation, severity, and timing, and it will elaborate on the patient's complaint. So let's just go through some questions of the OPQRST uh, just to uh, remember that. So what is the onset or origin of the discomfort? What provoked the discomfort? What is the quality of the discomfort? What uh, does the discomfort radiate? What is the severity of the discomfort? And what was the timing of the event? If the patient is more, has more than one chief complaint, ask the patient which symptom started first and which bothers him or her the most. So dyspnea, which is difficulty or labored breathing, is another chief complaint in ACS. Dyspnea may vary in intensity, and dyspnea is very difficult to assess because it is a sign and not a symptom. Ask the patient to rate the severity on a scale of 0 to 10. Dyspnea that develops suddenly suggests pulmonary embolism, pneumo, acute pulmonary edema, pneumonia, or an airway obstruction. So dyspnea that occurs on exertion or that suggests chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or left ventricular failure. Left ventricular failure causes blood or fluid to build up in the lungs. Proximal nocturnal dyspnea, or PMD, is a sudden onset of difficulty breathing in which the patient suddenly wakes up from sleep. It's associated with LVF, or left ventricular failure, usually begins two to four hours after the onset of sleep. It's often accompanied by coughing, wheezing, and sweating, and a feeling of suffocation upon waking usually improves after sitting up or standing for 15 to 30 minutes. If your patient has to cough, then find out whether it is dry or productive. If your patient has fainted, which is a syncopal episode, try to determine whether the patient fainted from cardiac or non-cardiac causes. Cardiac causes of syncope include dysrhythmias, increased vagal tone, and heart lesions. So consider a cardiac cause if fainting occurs in a recumbent position, is provoked by exercise, is associated with chest pain, or if a family history of fainting or sudden death is present. Patients with cardiac problems may present with chief complaint of palpations. This is a sensation of an abnormally fast or irregular heartbeat. It can be caused by anxiety or lack of sleep, certain medications, caffeine, stress, maybe cocaine or amphetamine use, heavy cigarette smoking, metabolic conditions such as hypothyroidism, or changes in the heart's rhythm or rate, including fast rhythms such as tachycardias and early beats. Ask about the onset, frequency, and duration of the symptom and previous episodes of palpations. Ask about the presence of associated symptoms such as chest discomfort, dizziness, syncope, and dyspnea. Fatigue is a common complaint in patients with impaired cardiovascular functions. Many causes or conditions cause fatigue. Ask when the patient's fatigue began and how long it has been present. Ask about associated symptoms such as chest discomfort, nausea, dyspnea, syncope, and palpations. Patients may report a variety of other related symptoms as you explore their history of present illness, including feelings of impending doom, nausea or vomiting, trauma involvement, or hypoxia. After you explore the patient's chief complaint, inquire about pertinent aspects of the patient's other medical history. Okay, so you want to ask about the medications, and is the patient taking them as instructed? When did he or she last take them? And is he or she taking medications prescribed for someone else, like uh, borrowed nitro? 
And then common cardiac medications include antidysrhythmics such as digoxin or amiodarone and verapamil. Also anticoagulants such as Plavix or Warfin, otherwise, um, otherwise called Coumadin, or angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors such as um, Vasotec, and beta blockers such as Atenolol or Metaprolol, lipid-lowering agents such as um, Lipitor or uh, Crestor, Zocor, and diuretics such as furosemide or Lasix vasodilators such as nitrogen or nitroglycerin or nitrostat. Um, also ask about non-cardiac medications such as over-the-counter meds, um, such as Viagra or Cialis, um, and herbal, herbal supplements can cause serious or even fatal interactions when taken with certain cardiac medications. And also ask about recreational drugs. Ask specifically whether the patient has ever been diagnosed with any of the following coronary artery disease, arthroscopic heart disease such as angina or previous MI, high blood pressure, hypertension, or heart failure, failure, an aneurysm, pulmonary disease, diabetes, renal disease, vascular disease, or inflammatory cardiac disease, or previous cardiac surgeries, such as a coronary artery bypass graft or a valve replacement. Okay, so then your secondary assessment. This is the look, listen, and feel. So the physical exam for a patient with cardiac complaints should emphasize on that condition. Skin color and temperature may indicate circulation problems. So patients with low CO and inadequate tissue perfusion may present pale, mottled, or cyanotic. This is a sympathetic response in which the blood within the peripheral vessels is shunted to the vital organs to maintain adequate perfusion. Flushed, warm skin may be a sign of an infection such as pericarditis. Okay, a physical exam includes the following steps, and this is inspect the neck and tracheal position, inspect the adjacent structures such as neck, neck veins. The external jugular veins are normally collapsed if a person is sitting or standing, but if the heart right side is compromised, the veins will distend from blood back up. To estimate jugular vein pressure, place the patient in a semi position with his head slightly rotated away from the vein. Observe the height of the distended fluid coming or column in the vein. Note how far up the distension extends above the sternal angle. Inspect and palpate the chest. Look for surgical scars um, indicating previous cardiac surgeries. Check for nitro pa uh, patch. And there may be a bulge under the skin of the patient's upper right or left chest or abdominal wall indicating a pacemaker or implantable defibrillator. Check for chest enlargement or a barrel chest, such as with COPD, and observe for any signs and symptoms of crepitus. Listen to the chest with your stethoscope. You're listening for crackles or wheezes, and that may indicate the LVF with pulmonary edema. Inspect and lightly palpate the patient's abdomen for distension and pulsations. Strong pulsations in the epigastric area may be a sign of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Check for swelling in the patient's arms, hands, feet, and ankles. Um, bilateral pitting edema may be a sign of right ventricular failure, and pitting edema limited to one side of the body suggests a blockage in a major vein. And then use the following monitor devices. An electrocardiogram or ECG monitor defibrillator enables paramedics to monitor and record three lead ECG tracings and record 12 lead ECG to transmit to the receiving facility. An ECG enables paramedics to quickly identify suspected AMIs, transmit the following, and make sound transport decisions. The device also gives pre-hospital providers the ability to treat cardiac dysrhythmias using electrical therapy such as defibrillation, synchronized cardioversion, and transcutaneous pacing. Attach the cardiac monitor, waveform capnography, 
and pulse ox when obtaining vital signs if not previously done. If the patient is relatively stable, a physical exam could be done while monitoring devices are in use. And then you're going to determine if there is a pulse deficient. So assessing an applicable pulse with a stethoscope. Place the stethoscope over the heart's apex, which is between the fifth and sixth ribs on the left side of the chest in adults. Palpate a peripheral pulse while listening to an apical pulse. A pulse deficit is a difference between the applicable apical pulse and the peripheral pulse. Check the patient's blood pressure. The accepted upper limit for a fall in systolic blood pressure with inspiration is 10 millimeters of mercury. Pulseless paradoxus occurs when the systolic blood pressure falls more than 10 millimeters of mercury with inspiration. Cardiac conditions in which this finding may be present include an AMI, cardiogenic shock, cardiac tamponade, and constrictive pericarditis. Check for a beat-to-beat -beat difference in the strength of the pulse. This finding is called pulseless alternance and may be a sign of severe ventricular failure. Okay, so blood pressure findings in cardiac patients. In older patients, systolic blood pressure of more than 140 millimeters of mercury is a more important risk factor for CVD than diastolic pressure. A systolic pressure of 120 to 139 millimeters of mercury or a diastolic pressure of 80 to 89 indicates pre-hyper pre-hypertension. Emergencies, elevated blood pressure may be from anxiety or pain. Systolic pressure lower than 90 may be hypotension or shock. Increased pulse pressure may indicate arterial sclerosis and reduced SV may be a sign of cardiogenic shock or cardiac tamponade. If possible, obtain and compare blood pressures in both arms. And then we're gonna listen to heart sounds. Listen to heart sounds to identify the lub dub, indicating the cardiac valves are operating properly. The major heart sounds are S1, S2, which are normal sounds, and S3 and S4 are abnormal sounds. S1 occurs during the beginning of the ventricular contraction when the tricuspid and mitral valves close. The sound of the tricuspid valve closing may be louder in cases of hypertension. S1 may be louder in patients with anemia, a fever, or hypothyroidism, as well as patients with stenosis of their mitral valve. Decreased S1 sounds may indicate um, some type of mitral valve problems, uh, obesity, emphysema, cardiac tamponade. A split sound from any delay in the closing of the valves is considered abnormal. S2 occurs near the end of the ventricular contraction when the pulmonary and aortic valves close. The sound will be louder in patients with chronic high blood pressure or pulmonary hypertension. The sound will be decreased in patients with hypotension. The sound will be split in a case of right bundle branch block or resulting in a delay in the pulmonic valve closing. The aortic valve may close more slowly than the pulmonic valve in situations involving left bundle branch blocks. S3 is an extra abnormal sound in adults caused by ventricular wall vibrations resulting from a rapid filling period of the ventricular ventricle during the beginning of diastole. So it is often associated with heart failure. And S4 is a rare heart sound heard just before S1 and is caused by turbulent filling of a stiff ventricle in the hypertrophy and possible myocardial infarct. A murmur is a sound of turbulent blood flow through the valves and it's caused by increased blood flow across the normal valve, flow across an irregular or constricted valve, blood flow into an enlarged heart chamber, and backwards blood flow through a compromised valve. Okay, and then we're going to do our reassessment. Reassessment should be done on the way to the hospital. 
repeat the primary survey, the level of consciousness, and the ABCs. Obtain vitals every five minutes for critical patients and every 15 for stable. Repeat the physical exam for changes and for any missed conditions. And assess the effectiveness of those interventions. Create proper documentation. And for patients with STEMI, transmit the 12-lead ECG to the cardiac lab. Okay, now this concludes the um, part one of chapter 17, Cardiovascular Emergencies. This was the anatomy and physiology review. And go ahead and listen to part two next, and that's going to be the electropathophysiology of the heart. And thank you for joining us today.